Okay, so I'm really excited to begin this tour. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about uh, Martin Wong's painting. And Martin Wong was a good friend of mine, so I'd like to give a little bit of background history and, uh, that serves as context for the way this painting was created. Martin lived in a tenement, a five-story tenement building on Ridge Street in Stanton in the Lower East Side of New York. Um, he, his, describing his building is pretty graphic because it was kind of a, a pretty unsavory place, yet he had a uh, three-bedroom apartment at the top floor of this building and the rent was cheap. Um, he converted the living room of the apartment to his painting studio where this work was created and the other bedrooms, one of them I remember was a, a kind of a sitting room where he was surrounded by all his books. Another room was just used as storage and then there was the room that he slept in. Martin didn't own a, a television set so that gave him a lot of time for painting and for observing things. So basically this building was the building directly across the street from him and on hot summer nights he would kind of sit in his kitchen and look out the window and each one of the windows served as a little vignette for what was going on inside of the building. People were arguing, there were police, people were cooking, going about their daily routine and he would just kind of imagine what was happening in the building. So instead of kind of populating the building with the people who were actually there, he decided to create this, this large-scale work, which is uh, a pretty much a cast of a lot of his personal friends, myself included. You'll see on one of the fire escapes, there's an inscription that says, Iron Aaron Works. And this was a, a third-generation fire escape company whose, uh, uh, there's another character in here, Sharp, him, his parents, owned this company. So it's kind of a dedication to um, his good friend Sharp's family's third generation uh, fire escape company. Oh, fourth generation, fourth generation fire escape men. That was their motto. Um, this painting was done in 1988. And as I previously said, it's just a kind of a cast of his personal friends as well as representatives of some of his obsessions. And one of his obsessions was firemen. He, he painted firemen, he found them interesting, uh, he was aroused by firemen, he was just fixated on them and, he, and they kind of, if you look at his body of work as a whole, you'll see them kind of popping up here and there. There's a very famous painting that he did that's in the collection of the Whitney Museum called Big Heat. And it depicts um, two firemen kind of locked in this kiss in front of a, a burning tenement building. Um, I'm going to kind of go through the painting and point out who some of the characters are and what their relationship to Martin was. Uh, this woman here on the lower left uh, is an Ethiopian woman and she is represented in another painting that he did, which is called African Temple. And this woman was just basically somebody, that he was walking home one night and she was kind of camped out in front of this building. She had all these hand painted signs and she had a cup out, so he, he just photographed her. She's not really one of his personal friends, but a lot of all these characters, um, the reference material was some personal photos that Martin took. Um, so she, she appears here. Um, you'll see that these, there are firemen kind of fi climbing up the fire escape, which is something that he witnessed um, them kind of scaling to get inside of a, an apartment that was burning down or where there was, a, there was a fire. There's a good friend of his, Sharp, his name is Aaron Goodstone, and he was uh, a kind of muse for Martin Wong. He appears in this painting uh, several times in several different states. So he was someone that, that Martin Wong, who appears throughout Martin Wong's body of work from the, some of the early work to the la some of the last paintings that he does. So Martin Wong, uh, sorry, Aaron is, is uh, depicted here holding a friend's baby. He's also depicted here with a shaved head. Uh, he's here holding kind of a wad of money. 
Um, let me see where else can I find him. He's, he's in here about four times. Um, I believe that's him as well. Uh, and these are just kind of candid pictures that he took. Uh, this, the guy in the yellow t-shirt, his name is Lee Quinones, who is a legendary New York City graffiti uh, writer and an amazing artist who's still working today. Uh, he was a, uh, a roommate of Martin Wong's for a period of time. So basically, uh, Martin wasn't really a good cook by any means. He, didn't, he, he ate most of his meals outside in the East Village and restaurants, but Lee was a good cook, so he made the perfect roommate for Martin's appetite. Uh, this girl right here, her name was Dottie. She was Sharp's girlfriend, longtime girlfriend, and they were kind of a really photogenic couple for Martin. They were both about the same height and kind of looked the same, and they probably could have passed for brother and sister, but they were actually a couple. Um, this is another girlfriend of Sharp's, Donna. <laughs> so his whole love life is depicted in this painting. Um, this police officer is a, a man named Sergeant Richard DeClara, who Martin didn't know him personally, but was somehow obsessed with this New York Times article about this police officer, and I don't really know a full story about that. Um, another character that's really important in the painting is Miguel Pinheiro, who is an award-winning playwright who wrote a play called Short Eyes. Um, he also was a character in films and television series like uh, Miami Vice, and he was in movies like Fort Apache, The Bronx with Paul Newman. He was also depicted, he was always depicted as sort of this street character, but whenever you saw him in a film, or a television show, he was always reciting his own dialogue. So the script writer, writers would throw the script away and they would just let him kind of improvise his own thing. And being a poet, he would do this quite a lot. Um, Pin, that's another Pinheiro. That's actually kind of how he looked in the, uh, in the movie um, Fort Apache, The Bronx. Uh, he began writing poetry when he was incarcerated in the tombs in Manhattan. And, he wrote a, this book called Short Eyes, which is basically was about a, ca a cast of characters within, within the prison system. Um, let me stand back for a minute. Um, Pinheiro is somewhere else around here. Um, I'm here, that's me, and that's me too. So I'm in a couple of, I appear in a couple of these paintings. Um, You'll see there's Mr. T from the television series, The A-Team. I don't know why he chose to put him in this painting, except that it kind of balances the Ethiopian queen on the, on the left-hand side of the painting. So it's created this balance. This scene here with the police, this is something that, ha this was um, based on an altercation that he saw in the building. This is the landlord of the building. And I think what happened was the, the owner of the building got mugged in his own building. So the police was called, and Martin always had a good relationship with his landlord, so he took photos of the whole thing, and, and that's what this scene depicted here is. Um, this woman here, that's uh, Sharp's mother. Uh, they were all, she was a good friend of Martin Wong's as well. Um, this character, his name was Stevie. He was another fixation for Martin. Um, kind of a muse and um, I don't know how, could, how to describe their relationship. He, he was kind of mentally challenged, I'll put it that way. And he had spent time in men mental institutions in New York and I think he had just gotten out of Bellevue one night and they met on the street. So he also lived off and on at Martin's apartment and during that time, Martin would photograph him and he'd somehow end up in a painting, just like everyone eventually does. Um, let's see, who else I can find here? Uh, this is an artist, LA2, who collaborated, who's actually pretty well known for collaborating early on with Keith Haring. Um, he was kind of a graffiti artist from the Lower East Side 
and he and Martin, Martin purchased a lot of his paintings and they became friends. Um, so that's kind of how we ended up here. And this kind of, this scene on the bottom part of the painting is, um, you know, it's a, it's a kind of uh, block party. Uh, it's very festive and, you know, it's a good foil to some of the kind of serious things that are going on within, within the painting. Um, you know, these are, they're kind of impromptu musicians and it kind of really shows um, a sense of kind of positivity or happiness in spite of, you know, the, the rest of the context, which is kind of serious. You know, these musicians would just kind of sit out in front of the building and play congas or guitar or, you know, play these percussion instruments. And, you know, it'd be like an impromptu block party with an open fire hydrant. Uh, La Vida is one of the largest paintings that Martin ever created. Uh, he, is originally, he was originally from San Francisco and he did painting, backdrop paintings for theater groups in the late 60s, uh, groups like the Angels of Light and uh, basically he was, um, he was a hippie. You know, I talked about, you know, knowing Janis Joplin and seeing her play in the park for free and kind of being a part of all that. And he moved to New York City in the late 70s, um, basically to become an artist. Uh, he felt that he would never really be recognized in San Francisco as a painter at that time, or at least the road would be really long. So he kind of came to New York to break into the art scene. Um, at one time, he and I, he and I were, as I mentioned, really good friends. And at one time, <clears throat> he and I both worked at the Metropolitan Museum together in, in the bookstore. And it was funny because we, we kind of just spent most of our time looking at books on the shelves, <laughs> doing stuff like that. Or, you know, at one point he got his hand caught in the cash register. And with, uh, it, was, it was pretty comedic. Uh, but he was, a, he was an amazing um, friend and, and inspiration and I would even say mentor for me in some ways. So it's really incredible that, uh, you know, we're hanging side by side within this gallery. So I, I'm going to kind of move on and talk about my two paintings. Uh, uh, wait, before we do that, do we have any questions about this one, this work? This character? But the lady on the far right. This lady? Yeah. I, I think that in, in that instance, he just wants to show that there's go, something going on inside of the apartment that you can't really see. Um, as I said, this was like uh, watching these people in the building was like t television for him. And you'll see somebody kind of off frame having a discussion with somebody, but you, you don't know what's going on. Yes, he was largely self-taught, but I believe he went to the, one of the universities there and had a degree in ceramics, uh, um, of all things. You mentioned photographs a couple times. Does he start with the photograph and then uses the photograph to base the painting on? Yeah, well, he would take very candid pictures uh, of people and of places, and he would work up a sketch, a very quick sketch, nothing really finished and he would just start painting. So as long as I knew him, there was no, um, he didn't begin by drawing this out in pencil on the canvas as some artists do, he would just start painting. He had all his reference material in front of him and he would just start working. And if you look at this painting, it's kind of interesting because I've talked to a number of people about it and everyone has their own idea about this point but you'll see that the perspective slants down to the right. And that's because the floor in his living room was uneven. So he was painting from left to right, kind of like that, <laughs> with painting bricks. So that unravels that mystery. 